Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining today in uh, beautiful Detroit. Um, so today, we're going to talk about why machines deserve rights, rethinking automated infrastructure access with open source teleport machine ID. So this is what my terminal looked like at an internship I did many years ago. We had this command, uh, we had this little file living there called secrets.txt. When we open that up, we get these, some long-lived credentials that our team used to access automated worker nodes that would frequently break. These lived in AWS, and we had them stored in a password vault, but because of the frequency we needed to access them, a bunch of people on the team just added them to local files on their machine. And this was a terrible, terrible, but common practice. And this is still a problem today. One in four employees still have access to old passwords, and 41.7% of employees admitted to having shared workplace passwords, um, long-lived credentials, AWS keys, SSH keys, et cetera. And this brings it to a security breach. Every security breach has two things in common, a human error for an initial infiltration, an attempt to pivot to maximize the blast radius. Human error. Six million of these credentials were leaked in 2021. Uh, this is according to a Git Guardian study that they did. Uh, these types of secrets that were committed were you know, Google Cloud keys, AWS IAM, uh, Azure API keys, join tokens. That's a two times increase since 2020. And this is because more and more companies are scaling with their cloud infrastructure, thus leading to more and more of these secrets and more of these leaks. And you might say, but we're not open source, so we'll never do that. Well, 85% of these corporate leaks came from developers' personal repos. They would fork the repo, um, and it was public, and then they would merge it back in once they were done with the PR. The next step is to maximize the blast radius. You get into a Slack workplace, you get access to a server. Get into a server, you're going to escalate those pr privileges. From there, you do what you want, and then profit. 50-50, uh, your results may vary. You'll either be on the beach uh, or someplace a little bit less nice. So some more numbers real quick. 26.8 million active software developers. There's supposed to be 45 million by 2030. There's around 8,000 data centers in the world with 50,000 physical servers per center. This varies widely depending on the size, but this is the average. 400 million of those physical servers, which means billions of virtual servers, trillions of containers. Uh, you know, it, it, the numbers are incalculable, how many virtual environments there are open to attack. The attack surface is immense. And all of these virtual servers, all of these physical servers are all running software written by humans. Humans who make mistakes. The problems with machine access. People make mistakes writing code. A misconfigured file here or there is the difference between a secure setup and uh, an embarrassing hack. Access problems are not limited to human developers. We need to stop thinking like this. Machine-to-machine -machine communication operates on outdated security principles. Security principles such as static credentials, SSH keys, API keys, shared creds when keys are used by different services, and perimeter security. Only the network boundary is protected. A VPN is simply not good enough anymore. And we also have siloed access policies for humans versus machine access. So what can we do? Treat machines the same way that you treat your developers. Give them rights. Provide each piece of automation with an identity. From a microservice uh, to a VM to any worker node in your environment, they should have an identity exactly like your human workers do. And eliminate shared credentials entirely. Every machine, every automated service, every uh, node should have its very own way of accessing the resources it needs to. Replace them with short-lived certificates. This way that there's no cred to lose. And enforce best practices by default. So this eliminates the need for these you know, costly and expensive uh, configurations where it takes you know, hours and hours to make sure you get it right and a missed comma here or there or an inconfigured service account is gonna ramp, uh, wind up in trouble. And tear down those access silos. So you have to think about the way you handle access for your machines with the same care that you do for your developers. 
to minimize the blast radius. Say, worst case scenario, one of those machines is compromised, you have to be able to eliminate from your network immediately without uh, letting it be the skipping point to the rest of your infrastructure. And keep it simple. The most secure solution also has to be the easiest. This is what we saw at the beginning where um, those credentials were ended up saved to these people's workstations is because it cut down on um, like developer time. Accessing these creds through some vault ended up costing time and was very annoying. So people will circumvent your security methods if you let them, if it's more complicated. So this brings us to open source teleport machine ID. Machine-to-machine uh, -machine access. So what open source teleport does is it handles four key pillars of access. Authentication, connectivity, and audit. Authentication. So for every service, for every node, you generate an identity in the form of a short-lived X509 certificate um, for the microservice and tie that identity to a role managed by Teleport. So Teleport has its own concept of RBAC that you can assign every machine directly to. So you can share roles while at the still at the same time maintaining that um, you know, uh, maintaining that accountability for these machines. Authorization. You need to be automatically able to approve or deny access requests to a range of resources, like servers, databases, Kubernetes clusters, microservices, and CI CD systems. And connectivity. We're gonna come back to this diagram in a second. But it also needs to handle the connection. It needs to establish a connection between the microservice and the requested resources using a reverse proxy tunnel from the teleport server to the resource. This communication is all encrypted and secure, eliminating the need for VPNs um, or you know, traditional bastion hosts and the like. And then audit. Extremely important for any compliance um, and any standard you're trying to reach, any security standard. You need accountability and you need to be able to review all of the actions that were taken by both your human workers and your machines. So this is kind of the high-level architecture. Uh, this is an example for Teleport um, configured with Ansible. Um, and so what you have is this uh, orange Teleport cluster over, well, I guess you can't see my cursor, but this orange Teleport cluster um, that has two parts. It has an off and a proxy service. The proxy service handles all of the traffic um, inside and out of the cluster. And then the off is a separate service that handles uh, your logging, it handles your um, you know, authentication and handling all those RBAC roles. Um, then you have this Ansible control node, and this is a separate node on, in your cloud. Um, and so when you create a new node or create a new worker, you're gonna onboard that to the teleport cluster. Um, once that teleport, you can do this in two ways. You can do this with either an ephemeral token or a dynamic join token like an AWS IAM. Um, and once you do that, then the machine will refresh its credentials every 20 minutes, or that's configurable. You can set it every five minutes, every 30, every hour. Um, that way, there's no long-lived credentials and there's no secrets that can be leaked. Um, this, then, will go through the teleport proxy uh, and access your host VM. In this case, this is a, a VM hosting a, um, a Kubernetes cluster. Um, from there, you'll use the SSH protocols uh, to actually run kubectl commands directly on the VM from your worker node. And you can do this in another way as well, um, where you can access the kube config directly through um, machine ID. It'll actually populate the kube config with the machine's RBAC rules baked right in. And then you can just run the kubectl commands from the node itself without having to go through Ansible or any SSH. Um, so let's see it in action. This is gonna be interesting, <laughs> live demos. Um, let's see if I can type on this screen. Hmm. Do, do, do. Let's get rid of this. Close, perfect. No, email, bad. Get rid of this. Okay. Okay, we can see this. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Um, all right, so let's begin. 
Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to do we're going to see both of those um, examples from the two architecture diagrams I showed you. Um, and let's see, can I make this bigger? No. Okay. Can everyone see this okay? Or should I try to make it bigger? Did that do something? Oh, now you can't see the edge? Uh, okay, wait. Let's just, let's, let's do this instead. I didn't do that, I don't think. Okay, can you see this now? Yes, perfect. Okay. So we're gonna have three windows here, three terminals. We're gonna have our Ansible control node. Um, we're gonna have our Kate's host here. And we're gonna have our teleport host. So first what we're gonna do um, is we're gonna create uh, our role for our bot. And this is the role that Teleport is going to use um, when it's assigning that role to the machine. And so let's go ahead and log in to our cluster. Um, this uses GitHub to authenticate as an SSO. And we're gonna log into our Teleport cluster. So we're logged in. Um, now we're gonna actually SSH onto our Teleport host. Perfect. So now we are in our teleport host. Um, so now what we're going to do is we are going to uh, create our role that our machine is going to use. So we're going to go ahead, and this role looks like this. We have our name, the machine ID cube demo. This is going to be the name of, this is so tiny, oh my gosh. A little bit better. Okay, <clears throat> so we're gonna have our name here, this machine ID cube demo, this is gonna be the name of our role. Um, and then we're gonna give it examples, we're gonna give it uh, Kubernetes access. And we're gonna assign it the Kubernetes user, Alice. And so let's go ahead and make our role here. Great, um, so we got our role now. And next we're gonna go onto our Kubernetes host and we're gonna create a Kubernetes role to, that we're going to mirror with our teleport role. Again, very small. Great, now we have uh, our Kubernetes role. And then we're gonna create the role binding, of course. Got that. And then we're gonna go back into our teleport uh, control node here, our teleport host, and we are going to actually onboard this bot into our cluster. So we're gonna run this command. Um, tcuddle is a CLI tool that allows you to interact with the teleport cluster. And we're gonna go ahead and add our cube demo bot with the roles of machine ID, cube demo, um, which is the role we just created, and another access role that we'll use for our SSH. Perfect. So we have this role, and we have now this token, this bot token here. This is what we're gonna use. This is only valid for 59 minutes. Uh, we're gonna use it to onboard our bot um, to the teleport cluster. And like I said, there's two ways of doing this. You could also use an, uh, like an AWS dynamic token as well. Um, perfect, so on the Ansible node here, um, we're going to open up this uh, tbot config here. Uh, whoops. Uh, whoops. Sorry, got a SSH onto our Ansible node first. I love um, live demos. Perfect, we're in our Ansible node. So now we can do our sudo vim 
Etsy tbot YAML. And this is what we're actually going to use to configure um, our tbot service, which is going to do the credential refreshing. So we're going to take this token, we're going to swap it out for the token that we had um, before that we got from our teleport host. So we're going to give it this token. And this is what we're going to use to onboard our bot. Um, so next, we're going to actually initialize this bot. Um, and so this is going to take in our config file. Um, we specify the directory that we want all of our credentials to be written to disk. So this is the, this is the directory that all of our SSH config and our cube config, it's all going to be written there and refreshed at a regular rate. Uh, we specify the bot user. Um, these are the Linux users. Um, and then the reader user, which is over here, um, which is going to be the user that our service is going to be imitating. Great. So now we have this. Um, so if we go in here, we can see all of these files that were created. All of this directory was just generated. And all of these files right now are completely blank. And what our TBOT service is going to do is it's actually going to instantiate those files with the credentials from the teleport host. Um, great. So now we're going to create a service um, using systemd um, to actually run the TBOT service in the background. And it's going to look like this. Um, it's pretty simple. Um, and it's just going to tell our systemd uh, to start up the teleport TBOT service. And then we can start refreshing those credentials. So this looks good. Um, we're going to go ahead and start up that service using system cuddle start machine ID demo. And let's get, let's check the status. Okay, so we can see that, um, ignore this error, that's fine. Um, we successfully renewed the impersonated certificates. We persisted the new certificates to disk. <clears throat> And we're starting to watch for the CA rotations. So this will persist every 20 minutes. And let's take a look again now at our um, files that we had. So if we go back into our um, directory that we specified earlier, whoops, let's go into here, and we can take a look at some of these files. So now, if we cat our kubeconfig YAML, we actually see that we have a whole kubeconfig. And this was generated from the teleport host. And so um, if we export our kubeconfig here to this um, opt machine ID cube demo, Now we can actually interact with our cluster. Uh, whoops. Cube config, there we go. And now we can actually interact with our cluster. From the worker node, um, all going through the teleport proxy service. And we can go into and actually check it out. We have a web view here. And we sign in with GitHub. And we can see, if we go into our audit log, we can see all of the activities that we were just doing. So we can see that the Kubernetes request, um, we can see all of the metadata from here. Um, all of this can be fully fed into like anomaly detection tools or other you know, log aggregators. Um, and we can have, we can see our active sessions here. So we see that our, we're logged into Ansible. We see that we're logged into the control node. Um, and we can see our session recordings as well. So all of the sessions, all the SSH sessions are actually going to be recorded here um, if this would load. And then you can actually play them back. And these aren't actually videos. Um, they're just a, a collection of commands um, that will run. Perfect. Um, and so the last thing we're going to do is we're going to show the Ansible example. 
Um, so in our Ansible node here, we're gonna look at our Ansible config um, and see that our SSH args are actually just set to our machine ID directory where we get those SSH configs that are refreshed on a regular rate. So this way, in the past, what you'd do is you'd manage SSH keys, um, which were long-lived and would become a pain, both for rotation and just for security vulnerabilities. Once those keys were leaked, they're out there. But with Teleport's uh, machine ID, these are refreshed every 20 minutes, every on whatever cadence you want, uh, making it much more secure and easier to deal with. So we have this. Um, so now, if we go into our other directory, we go into our demo folder here, um, and we can try to actually run our playbook here. And what this playbook is going to do is that it is going to um, actually run um, cube, cube cuddle commands on the SSH node um, of the, that's being hosted, the, that's hosting the Kubernetes service. Perfect. So we just have to change our key permissions here for Ansible. And then we should be able to run Ansible playbook and playbook.yaml. Uh, Ansible playbook, playbook.yaml. And so what we should see here is that um, this Ansible control node is going to copy, nope, did, that is not correct. <laughs> um, do, 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 okay, that's fine. So we're gonna change this permission again. Cube demo. And now, we should see, perfect. So now what the Ansible control node is gonna do is it's going to access our Kubernetes host. Um, it is gonna upload the pod YAML and deployment YAML configurations that we have written here. Um, and it's actually going to create a pod and create a deployment on the Kubernetes cluster. And we see that the pod Nginx was created and we see that the Nginx deployment was created. So if we actually say kubectl git pods dash name namespace equals uh, demo namespace. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Let's see where are these guys. Um, so we see our Nginx pod in the demo namespace along with our Nginx deployment replicas. And that is uh, the end of the demo. Um, so let me go back to the slides. Bum, bum. And we can skip to the end here. Maybe if we are cooperating, please. Okay, well, I mean, you get the picture. Um, so thank you all so much. Thank you for, uh, that's a teleport machine ID. <clears throat>
Biffy Spire, which I'm a lot more familiar with, also kind of with the way it does keys and management of identities and other things like that, also has somewhat of a cattle view. Sure. Um, and I may have just picked up on something on your slide without really understanding it, so I'm just asking. Um, when you talk about all machines have identities, is this more in the pets category or the cattle category? And maybe you can also explain what I mean by pets and cattle. Yeah, so it certainly falls more into the, the, the reason that you give it an identity um, is to um, you know, treat it with the same accountability that you would like a human. So um, it's not like, like a pet in that like, you can do this also for like just ephemeral um, like worker nodes. Um, so it's, it's all about just kind of consolidating access rather than like making it something it's not. It certainly is a cattle, and we're still viewing them just as like worker nodes, um, and they are, can be completely ephemeral. Um, so it's just all about way of like consolidating that access rather than making them like more special than they need to be or something like that. Um, which I also forgot actually is in the future. So a lot of like a core of this product um, in the use is like a CI CD workflow way um, so that you can handle this access without having these long lived credentials that then get leaked in a GitHub repo, for example. So in Teleport 11, the next release, we'll actually have GitHub Actions support. Um, so that you can interact with teleport protected resources directly from these workflows without need for secrets in GitHub even, for example. Um, and we also have Kate's support for automatic service discovery. So you can have a cluster running this service and anytime you create new pods um, or new you know, microservices or new nodes, those will automatically be added and onboarded to the teleport cluster without doing that whole setup that we just did. Um, so right now we have that support for SSH nodes, um, like in EKS, for example, um, but we don't, or um, sorry, not EKS, uh, whatever it's called, uh, or yeah, EKS. Um, but uh, that'll come in Teleport 11. So this is like the kind of the core value here is this CI CD workflow, so that you don't have to have these persistent creds um, in your infrastructure, and that's kind of the idea. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Another one over here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, great question. Um, so yeah, you can do it by tags or by labels, um, and as soon as there's a, a there's a match, that will be that uh, node will be onboarded to the cluster with its own unique identity. Um, so this identity will be generated again from its own X509 certificate, um, and it will have some like configurable naming convention that you can give it, and you can differentiate them while still grouping them under the label of whatever you know, like worker node or whatever like service that you're employing with them. Does that make sense? Perfect. Great. Oh, over here as well. Um, user identity in terms of like, I'm sorry, a developer laptop? Yeah, no, absolutely, and that's like, so that's more of like the human use case, but that's also like a core teleport service, is that like machine ID is just one of the offerings, um, but what people typically do is that it'll integrate with like your SSO, like Okta or GitHub or whatever, um, and then you can do all of this for like a human developer or like a, even just like a developer laptop, like you said. Um, so you totally can do that, yeah. And that's kind of the core business right now of Teleport. The wider use case is for engineering teams that need shared access to different resources. Um, they use Teleport instead of like using a password vault or um, you know, like juggling a bunch of SSH keys or something like that. But yeah, thank you guys so much again, and um, hope to see you at the KubeCon booth. Thank you.